for thousands of people across Britain, someone is missing from their lives. Does he still love me? He's my dad. Why did he not come back? Giving him up is the worst thing we ever done. The guilt sometimes is unbelievable. I've got a big sister. Where is she? And why didn't I know about her? Finding someone when the trail's gone cold can feel like an impossible task. But that's where we step in. Your son's been found. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Offering a last chance to people desperate for help. Hi, darling. Hi, Good Good picture of my dad. Oh, wow. From DNA technology to painstaking detective work, we've travelled the world, uncovering family secrets and tracing people that no one else could find. John. Hi. Good Nikki. morning. I've got the test results here, the DNA test. Oh, my God. And finally answering questions that have haunted entire lives. <laughs> I'm your ex-sister. <laughs> <laughs> This week, two searchers whose lives were torn apart by circumstances beyond their control. Our first ever search on behalf of a birth father desperate to find an adopted child. I felt so helpless. He's my son. He was just taken away. And a woman raised in children's homes longing to find her mother. Our first search comes from the West Midlands and a father desperate to find the son he's only seen once. And they took me down to the nursery and there was this little wrapped up bundle with the ginger head sticking out the top and uh, I just cried. He's my son. And, um, and that was the last time I saw him. Something like that, yeah. yeah. 74-year-old Andy McNichol lives in Walsall with Hazel, his wife of 45 years. That's Antigua. Now retired, Andy and Hazel devoted much of their life to fostering children. We fostered for about 15 years. And we've had lots of children, and they've given us a lot of pleasure. Oh, dear. Mostly boys. I used to take them a football. I used to love it, stand on the sidelines shouting. Yay! He's got a connection with children. He's so caring and kind and loving. And guy. But there's one person missing from the family album, John, the son who Andy had before he met Hazel. John, there's so much I would have liked to have done with him. I've missed so much. It's something I've regretted all my life. Andy met John's mother, Brenda, in the 1960s, when they were both working in Froome in Somerset. I was about 26, and I think she was about 22. He was love, all right. She was a pretty, pretty girl, and she had a real good soul. Two years into their relationship, Brenda discovered she was pregnant. I kept saying to her, I'll tell your dad. Tell your mum and dad, tell your mum. And she kept saying, no, I'll do that. But she didn't. I should have. I was wrong. I think if I'd gone to them and spoke to them, things might have worked out different. Brenda couldn't hide the pregnancy for long. And in a small town like Froome, having an illegitimate child could still carry a stigma. When her parents found out, they hoped Andy would marry Brenda. But Andy wasn't free to marry. I couldn't get married. I was still married. I, was, I had a divorce going through. There was no way I could get married before the baby was born. They were an old-fashioned family, and they didn't like that. She had the choice. And if she continued to see me, the family would disown her. And she was a strong family girl. Brenda broke off all contact with Andy. 
The next he heard was that she had given birth to their son. I went straight into the hospital and asked to see the baby. They took me up to the nursery. And I was looking through this glass and they pointed him out to me. And he was just a little ginger head sticking above the blankets. Right ginger head like his mother. Uh, but they wouldn't let me go in and touch him or hold him or pick him up or nothing like that. Andy never saw his son again. Against his wishes, John was put up for adoption. I felt so helpless. You know, I thought, hang on a minute, this child's mine. You know, I just couldn't, couldn't grasp it. He could do this to me. Saddest day of my life, without a doubt. Yeah, saddest day. Andy was devastated to learn that he wasn't even on John's birth certificate. Mother's name, but no father's name. I actually went up to the register when I heard this and said, no, I'm the father. And he said, I've been registered. So that's it. This boy was my son. I was helpless, I couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> yeah. Is this milk all right, dear? Andy's wife, Hazel, witnessed his grief when they first met. The baby was born in June, and I met him in November, and he was still very, very raw. He's cried in my arms over this baby. I think he felt that he'd lost part of himself. It was hard. You grieve. You, you, it's just like a bereavement. You grieve. 46 years since he last saw his son, Andy has never given up hope of finding him. I think about him all the time. All the time. I want to tell him that I didn't leave you. You were given away, son. If I'd had my way, it would never have happened. I don't want him to know that he was loved. He was definitely loved, and he still is. Because of the need to protect the identity of adopted children, the only way we could find John was by working with a specialist intermediary legally allowed to access records. They discovered that he was still called John and had grown up in Western Supermare. We found records of John living in the UK up until 2013, but after that, there was no trace of him. Could John have moved abroad? To find out, we needed a new line of attack. So, we decided to search for John's adoptive parents. John's adoptive mother had passed away, but we did manage to track down his adoptive dad. And he was able to tell us where to find John. In Australia. John had married an Australian and moved out here three years ago. I'm meeting him at his home in Caperty in New South Wales where he works as a chef. During our search, we learned that John's birth mother passed away nearly 40 years ago, and we told him that away from the cameras. Thanks. Ever since he saw that red-headed baby in the hospital, Andy has longed to know his son. But what about John? After more than 40 years, did he ever think his father would come looking for him? John! Hi. How are you doing? Good, pleased to meet you. What a place this is. It's good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. quite something. Come on in. Fantastic. 
Being in a place like this, you're kind of difficult to find. Did you think you ever would be found? No, I, I was gobsmacked, to be honest, that um, my father was looking for me. I'm like, really? And it was just like, astonishing, really, because I, I honestly thought if either woman's going to be looking for me, it would be my mother. And what was your childhood like? I was lucky that I had adopted parents that, you know, they were great. But you still feel like you've done something wrong. You felt a sense of rejection? Yeah. It was always in my mind that my biological parents didn't want me, they just gave me away. I've always wondered what happened. I've got lots to tell you. Your birth mother and your birth father loved each other and she fell pregnant mm. and he wanted to bring you up with your mother in a family. But he was in the middle of a divorce and that was unacceptable. Mm. He wanted to be a father but couldn't be, wasn't allowed to be. Mm. And just knowing that, that he wanted to, to be a father makes a big difference. Mm. He saw you once. Mm -hmm. Just after you were born, he went to the hospital. He just saw the, this beautiful baby with red hair. Mm. Knowing that he felt like that about you, is that a good thing? It is. It's yeah. a surprise. It is. It's a very, very much a surprise, because now it, it, it boots out the bit of my brain saying I wasn't wanted. It's nice to be wanted. Yeah. Well, you've written your letter, which I've got here. Dear John, when I last saw you, you were one day old behind glass in the hospital. I would really like to see you, as there are so many things I would like to tell you about myself and to know that you're alive and have a good life. Hope to see you, Andy. P.S. There has always been a void in my heart, not knowing what has become of you. Mm. He loves you. I mean, the only thing I'm missing now is knowing what he looks like. You want to know what he looks like? Right. Oh. Right. Like an older version of me. Really? Yeah. Why? Right. I can't believe that he's been looking for so long. Do you feel different now? Yeah, I do. I feel a lot different. If I'm honest, there's a lot of excitement. He had the capacity to love me even though he nearly saw it, ever saw me once, you know? Which makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to meet him now. Mm. Before we tell Andy the news that his son's been found... Our second search is on behalf of a woman longing to find her birth mother after a childhood spent in care. Fifty-five-year-old Mary Davis lives in Hounslow. <laughs> Married to her childhood sweetheart, Tim, they have two children who are now grown up. Although she loves being a mum, Mary didn't grow up with her own mother. Mary was born on the 3rd of November, 1961, to an Irish mother, Bernadette Sweeney.
She spent the first six weeks of her life with Bernadette in a home for unmarried mothers in North London run by nuns. The home no longer exists, but their records are held in nearby St Joseph's Church, including Mary's baptism. When she was six weeks old, Mary was placed with an adoptive family. But her adoption soon ran into trouble. Mary's hearing started to deteriorate. Her new parents decided they couldn't cope with a deaf child. And after only three months, they sent her back. Mary Davis grew up in care after the family who planned to adopt her decided they couldn't cope with a deaf child. For the first six years of her life, she lived in a series of children's homes. No one would adopt her. But when Mary was seven, her life changed. She was fostered by a couple who had a deaf daughter. She lived with them until she was 17. Mary went on to marry Tim. But as their own family has grown, so has her need to find her mother. Mary began searching for her mother 15 years ago. And last year, she finally had a breakthrough. She discovered that Bernadette had another daughter called Shirley, five years after Mary was born. Mary hasn't been able to find any further trace of Bernadette and Shirley. And she's wondered if her mother has told her sister about her. The last record we had of Mary's mother, Bernadette, she was living in London in the 1960s with her daughter, Shirley. So that's where we started our search. We scoured UK records for Bernadette and Shirley. But we could find no trace of them living here. So we decided to search in the country where Bernadette was born, Ireland. We knew that she came from Sligo, so that's where we focused our attention but our searches for them there also drew a blank. Our next step was to look for siblings who might know of their whereabouts. After six months, we had a breakthrough. We discovered that Bernadette had a brother, Kieran. He had passed away, but we were able to trace his widow. We contacted her, hoping that she could lead us to Bernadette. But instead, she broke the tragic news that Bernadette had passed away in 2007.
Mary will be heartbroken with the news that she'll never be able to meet her mother. So we were desperate to find her half-sister, Shirley. Using new information from Kieran's widow, we were able to trace Shirley on social media. She now lives in Ireland, but agreed to meet me in Kilburn, North London, close to where she and her mother, Bernadette, known in the family as Bernie, once lived. And Shirley also told us that she was not the only sibling. Bernie had had four other children. This could be really tough for Shirley. Did she know she had a sister? And how will she feel when she learns that Mary had a difficult childhood? Shirley. Hello, Nikki. Hey. <laughs> nice to see you. You too. Have a seat. Thank you. Well, it's so good to meet you. It's good to meet you. Did you know that you had a sister? No idea. Nobody in my family, none of my siblings. We were never told. What was your first reaction when you heard? Well, I was very shocked. It's good, you know, I'm happy, yeah. I'm excited, yeah, as are my siblings, you know. Yeah. When I look back, that makes sense to me, because I got pregnant myself at 16, 17. And um, I was adamant that I was giving my child up for adoption, because I was too young. My mother said no. There was no way that Bernie was letting me put my child up for adoption. Now I know why. She didn't want me to go through the same pain that she carried with her. Mm. For that, that's, that's extraordinary. Extraordinary. And I'm so glad now, because I have a wonderful daughter. Let me tell you a bit about Mary. Mary spent the first six weeks of her life with Bernadette in a mother and baby home in North London, uh, run by nuns. She was given up for adoption. Shortly after, her hearing began to deteriorate. OK. And the adoptive family changed their mind because they didn't want to have a baby with hearing problems. Poor girl. Mary's deaf now and communicates using sign language but it was difficult for her to find a long-term, stable home until she was actually seven years old. Wow. That's heartbreaking, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. You know? I, I don't know what... I don't know what to say. I, I'm going to have to learn some sign language. <laughs> Are you yeah. going to, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, she's my sister, 100%. To communicate with our Mary, I would certainly be learning the language. So, Mary, she's happy now? She's happy. She's okay. in a great relationship. Oh, she, uh, her partner is Tim. Tim. Yeah, and Lovely. she's got uh, two children. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I'm just so happy that she's happy now. Does Mary look like me? Oh. Oh, wow. She's beautiful. She's lovely. She's got Bernie's eyes. <laughs> so this was my mother. Wow. She looks like Mary. When you put these photos together, this is just wow. It's Bernie's daughter. My sister. God, I just want to give her a hug. <laughs> I can't wait to meet her. She belongs with us. I, I don't know her and I love her. It's amazing. And I learned that inside to tell her. Andy McNichol came to us searching for his son, John who he saw just once before he was given up for adoption. We found John living in Australia, and I'm on my way to tell Andy the good news. Andy's search was a first for us because we've never had a birth father on his own looking for an adopted child. He's desperate to let his son know that he was wanted 
and loved. And now he's going to get the chance to do that. Andy? Hello. Hello. Nice to meet How you. How are you? You all right? Oh, lovely, thank you very much. Oh. Much better for seeing you. Oh. Thank you very much. Come in. Oh, thank Come you. Come in. Thanks very much. Have a seat. Thank you. <sighs> so, your story, it's such a tough one. And I just wanted to talk to you a bit about what it felt like. Just that feeling of hopelessness. It was like a bereavement. Mm. That the child had been... I'd seen him for five minutes, and then I never saw him again. What was that like when you saw him? Oh. Hard. Cos, uh, I was the father of the son, and uh, I wanted to know that, and know that he was loved. Well, you can tell him yourself. I hope so. No, you can, because he's been found. <laughs> Does he want to see me? He does. Oh. <laughs> oh, take, take your time, it's OK. Is he well? He's well. Oh. And uh, he's a chef and he's in Australia. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> He's been there for three years. Oh. He always knew that he was adopted, but he never looked because he was frightened of being rejected. I could put that right. Well, I think that'll mean a lot to him. I could put that right. Yeah. I got up this morning, it was just another day, and now it's a new day in my life. It's just a new, hopefully a new start. Do you want to see a photo? Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. He's got my build, all right, yeah. He's got my build. He's got my nose, I think. Oh, can I keep this? Yes, of course. Oh. <laughs> That's my boy in Australia. There's never a day goes by that I never think of him. Always. He was, he was loved. But, you know, what's lovely is you can tell him all of that. I will do. I can tell... Pardon? Is he coming over here? Is he? <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, that's a pleasure. So much. It's a pleasure. Oh. Bless you. <laughs> oh, God! Oh, I do love you. I do love you. Oh! She's living in Australia. No, it's not. Yes. Hey. Today, one week after discovering John has been found, Andy is going to see his son. John has travelled 10,000 miles from Australia to Somerset to meet his father for the first time. Thank you. Nice to see you. Really good to see you. Right. Jacket, let's go. Finding out that you were wanted yep. and you were loved, that's a whole... I mean, how is that a new reality? This, it makes a difference. Does it? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Knowing that he'd always been thinking about me. Have you got the butterflies? Yeah. 
I mean, I'd be lying, you know, if I said I'd had no, no worries or doubts, you know. What if I meet him and he doesn't like me? Hello, Davina. How are you doing? Oh, very well, thank you. Good to oh. see you again. So, you ready? Yep. Let's go. Andy and John are meeting in a pub outside Bath, the city where John was born. OK. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thanks. So, how are you feeling? I'm petrified. Today's, um, it's the biggest day of my life. Because all them years ago, that's all I wanted to do was just pick him up, give him a hug, and say, you know, this is my son. And now I can do it. So, this is actually where I say goodbye. But Thank your you. son's over there. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. I, uh, I knew you were out there somewhere. You know what I mean? And you were part of me. I love you to death. And Good. I loved you when I didn't know you. Mm. I loved you when you were born. And it's nice to know, you know, that the, you were wanted. the reason why, yeah. Mm, that makes a big difference. Yeah, you were loved and wanted. Mm, it's nice to be wanted. Yeah. But up until, well, a few weeks ago, I didn't know you did. Yeah. But now you, I know you do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good health. Cheers. You know, the fact that he understands that he was wanted and loved, that makes all the difference. Makes all the difference to me. I've always wanted to be able to tell you what went on, what actually mm. happened. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But I have felt guilty for a lot of years. because it wasn't, it wasn't your decision. You, no, it wasn't no, my decision. No guilt to be had. It's nothing to forgive. It, it, he had no choice in the matter. How can I be angry or, or aim for that? Just the fact that you were looking and you took the time to look proved that you cared. Yeah. Oh, it's... You know? And that, and to me, that, that... That meant a lot. It's just not really sunk in yet that my father's here and he wants to see me. Just for him to walk in and call me his son, I'm not going to feel second best anymore. It's the best day of my life, without a doubt. He's my son, and he's here today with me. <sighs> and I love him. Mary Davis has been searching for her birth mother, Bernadette, for 15 years. But sadly, we discovered that she's passed away. We've told Mary this news away from the cameras. It's tragic that Mary will never get to meet her birth mother. I hope discovering that we found her sister might help ease her grief a little. Hey. 
Yeah, bye. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hello. A sign language interpreter is helping to translate. Thank you so much for talking to me. I'm so, so sorry that we couldn't bring you better news about your mum. I'm sorry. I've got something for you. like her, I think. Your mum, Bernadette, went on to have five children after you. We got all this information from your sister. Shirley. <laughs> she really wants to meet you. She didn't know about you, and so she was very surprised, but so excited. After Nikki had spoken to her, she bought a book on sign language so she can start learning. She really wants to tell you all about your mum. Today, Mary's finally going to meet her sister Shirley. Shirley has travelled from Ireland to North London to meet Mary. Myself and my siblings, we bought her a bracelet with sister on. And I've been practising sign language. Um, I've learnt two sentences. It took me a week, but I've learnt it. The sisters are meeting at a pub, close to the site of the mother and baby home where Mary was last with their mother, Bernie. The interpreter is also there to help.
nerves are kicking in. Up, but no, I'm so nervous. so long and that you couldn't meet Bernie, but you have, you have siblings who are all dying to meet you. Out of all the siblings, I'd say you're the one that looks the most like her. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. God, she missed out not seeing you, you're beautiful. <laughs> We've got a bracelet for you. That's oh. with sister. <laughs> You're our sister. <laughs> You're welcome. All my siblings want you to come to Ireland, have a big family reunion. <laughs> You, you are part of us. Welcome to the family. Just a great connection with her. It was like I knew her all my life. You look younger than me. You've got the best genes. You look way younger than me. <laughs> Mary's part of the family. She's she's our sister. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Next time on Long Lost Family, a man separated from his mother by tragedy. I can only see her world falling apart. How could a mother ever forget that? And a woman desperate for her son to understand the choices she had to make. If I could just see him for once and tell him that I'm sorry for not being there for him when he needed me.